I feel greatly privileged to be here today. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound. Amen. I have a notion there's a lot of people bound today that need to be set free. Amen. That's in every class of people and every group of people, and even among us who go to church and who uh, love the Lord, uh, we, there's areas where we find ourselves to be bound. But today, we're going to uh, look, the uh, text is found in Psalms chapter 40. In Psalms chapter 40, we'll have a few verses there. I'm thinking of, the, of what the, the uh, psalmist said, one thing have I desired. And I think, you know, uh, how many times have, there's a whole list of things I want. But uh, how about uh, narrowing it down? What would it be if you just could say just one thing that you really want? And that's what he said. One thing have I desired, that will I seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Amen. And if you, if, you, if you boil that down, it's saying an awful lot in just one verse. But to behold the beauty of the Lord. We, have, we are a privileged people to, to see the beauty of holiness. So thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, just, I, I want to, if, if I would be a t- putting a title to this message, it would be A Testimony. And uh, because uh, uh, testimonies, are, I think, are very, very important. And uh, everybody that's saved has got a testimony. And uh, if I could say this, the most important testimony in this room today is yours. Yep. And uh, if you're saved and born again. Three very important dates I think that all of us should, should know about. And one, the one is October the 12th, 1492. You know what that was. That's when Columbus discovered America. It impacted all of our lives, affected it, it even today. And then another date was July the 4th, 1776. That's when our country actually it took form and took uh, where our where our government was established in this country and came to be. But there's another date that I, that I uh, think is a sorry thing that uh, it seems America has so quickly forgotten, and that's September the 11th, 2001. And over 3,000 people were swept into eternity so quickly and so recklessly and so needlessly, and God forbid that we should forget what the enemy does, the enemy of God and the enemy of America. But please allow me, folks, today to point out another day in American history that I find very, very important. I hope you don't consider me conceited for for, uh, pointing out this date, but it's January the 20th, 1950. Ah, but that's when I discovered America because that's the day that I was born. And you see, that's when God gave me a body. Very, very important to me. And though I live in a crippled body, it's very precious to me because you see, this is my only ticket to live in this world, in this beautiful world. Yes, this world was made beautiful, but sin has marred it and has damaged it. And I'm looking forward to when the Lord comes back and sets things in order again. But I'm saying this body is precious to me. And you know what? It's also precious to God because the Bible says what? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which is of God, and you're not your own for you are bought with a price. And so, hallelujah, praise the Lord. God has bought us with a price, a great price that he has paid for us. And did you know uh, this body is precious. Our bodies are precious to the Lord. In Deuteronomy, I think there's a beautiful little verse there. Maybe we've overlooked it too much, but it says, the Lord's portion is his people. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 7. And did you know that's simply saying that God's people are very precious to God Amen. and his portion God's portion is his people. And by the way, folks, that's exactly why that Satan hates us so much. Because we are made in the image of God. Right. We are different. We're not just at the top of the animal kingdom. Oh, no, there's a big difference. We are made in the image of God. Not so with the animals. I'm simply saying, folks, I thank God for life. I thank God for my life. Even if I live in a body 
You could say, I'm not, all, I'm not quite all there. You know what they say sometimes about folks? Well, that's me. It took me oh, 60 years to get to weigh over 100 pounds. And uh, now I'm weighing a little over. They weighed me at the clinic the other day, and I weighed 103 pounds the first day. And the next day, uh, I weighed out, uh, a couple days later, I weighed out at 106. So I, I guess they're doing me some good. But, uh, but, uh, but let, uh, hey, the, the pounds I gained that may took me over 100 pounds, I'm sorry to say, none of it was any muscle. So, but anyhow, I'm saying I thank God for life. The Bible says, in the book of Job, the Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. Amen. I believe that. That's what the psalmist was saying when he said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Folks, you don't have to go all traipse all over the world to see the seven wonders of nature, to see the glory of God and the wonders of God. We can look at your hands, you can look at your body, and see the marvelous work of God. Modern day scientists believe that they came from tadpoles when they began to begin. And next they were a frog with a tail tucked in. And then it became a monkey uh, swinging in a coconut tree. And today they're a bald-headed professor with a Ph.D. Yes, I understand. But listen, I simply believe the Word of God. And by the way, the God speaks about those people when He says, The fool has his said in his heart there is no God. Right. Listen, folks, you can't believe in evolution and in the Bible both. Right. That's a contradiction in terms because there's some Christians say, well, I believe both. I believe that's how God created. That's, that cannot, then the Bible is not true. That's right. And I don't believe you can get saved if you don't believe the Bible's true. Right. Amen. And so I'm going to say the first words of the first line of the first verse of the first chapter of the first book says, in the beginning God created. I believe that. I believe that. Evolution is the biggest hoax, the biggest lie that has ever hit this world. You say, preacher, I, I, I disagree. I think, ever, I think abortion is even worse than evolution. Let me tell you something today. Abortion would have never happened in this world if it wouldn't be for evolution. That's right. I mean, if we're nothing but animals anyhow, what difference does it make if we kill one another? That's right. But I'm saying that evolution and abortion go hand in hand like liberalism and ungodliness goes hand in hand as well. If the educators, if the scientists of our day, if the politicians, and yes, throw in the theologians as well into that mix, if they would believe the Bible and teach, read the Bible and practice it, they would save themselves a heap of ignorance and stupidity. The Bible says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void but shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereto I send it. That's yes. God speaking. Yep. His word will have an effect. Yep. I hope that today as the word goes forth right here, that it'll find lodging and it'll produce fruit in where it lodges because the power of God is in the power of the word. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. So, Psalm 62, Psalm 68 says, it, The God of Israel is He that giveth power and strength unto His people. Amen. And folks, Amen. we are His people by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. There's power in the Word. Success. We all want success. Well, you can go into a, self, into a Bible bookstore or a self-help uh, shelf and you can find books on success all over the place. And uh, there's, the, there's seven steps to success. You go a little bit further, you'll find a thinner book that says three steps to success. I the, I'll take that one. We want to get there faster, huh? Can I tell you something this morning? The word success is only used one time in the Bible. And that is in connection with observing and following and taking seriously commandments of God. 
It was when God was speaking to Joshua yep. and Joshua was to take over the reins that Moses had and he was to take over the leadership of Israel and God says, This book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Right. There it is. The only place in the Bible God wants us to be successful, but he wants us to be successful in his terms according to his commandments. Right. And I, I love what the psalmist says, let the Lord be magnified who taketh pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Now notice it says his servants, those, those who, are, who are serving him. Yes. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. Let's read our text. You forgot. You thought I forgot. Uh, what the text? No, we just haven't gotten there yet. Sometimes the introduction is too long. But uh, in uh, Psalms chapter 40, in verse 1, we'll read three verses here. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Aren't you glad? He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Amen. Ah, but look, there's more. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Amen. That's a powerful, personal testimony of David, the psalmist. And listen, he says that the Lord brought him up out of a horrible pit. That's how anybody or everybody that's saved is the testimony for all of us. David grew up in a God-fearing family, but he was in a horrible pit. Can I tell you something? The pit of religion is as deep as the pit of sin. And we need to be delivered from it. We need to be raised up for, out of it. Both my wife and I were born and raised Amish. Now, some of you know about them. And some of you have met them and seen them. But, uh, but uh, that means that our four parents between the two of us we had four parents and all of them were born and raised Amish and then there was eight grandparents logically speaking all of them were born raised died Amish you take that one step further back there's 16 great grandparents all of them were born raised died Amish would you say that gives us a strong Amish heritage? You might ask, well, what does an Amishman believe? That's very simple. He believes the same thing his parents believe. Yep. Well, what did his parents believe? They believe the same thing the church believes. What does the church believe? The church believes in a set of traditions that developed over 350 years. In a time that somebody would ask, what does God tell us to believe in? Jesus said, except you be born again, ye will not see the kingdom of God. Right. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Folks, we're under the wrath of God. We're born under the wrath of God. Right. We need to be delivered from underneath out of there. And the Bible talks about the importance of what we believe. Jesus himself said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that has sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come unto condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Acts chapter 16. I'm thinking of the time when Paul and Silas were out street preaching and they got arrested and they got jailed and they got beaten. And, and that night, uh, an amazing thing, they had been beaten and, and they were hurting, and they were put in stocks where they couldn't even reach to, to, to scratch themselves or rub themselves where it was hurting. And you know what they did? They sang songs. Yep. You know what Christians do today that have a little bit of suffering? Why me, God? Yeah. Lord, don't you love me? Why do I go through this suffering? You know, the Bible says without suffering, without tribulation, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's right. We're a bunch of spoiled brats in America, I'm afraid. 
And by the way, you don't have to look back to the 15 and 1600s to know that Christians are dying for their faith. It's happening today. Yeah. You just won't hear it from your news media from, from here. If, uh, if a Christian does something bad to, to an unbeliever, if it happens on the other side of the world, CNN will announce it here. But the other way around, you won't hear that. That's because they serve the same God that is, the doing the, 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 is in control of the people that are persecuting the Christians. But I'm saying it's important what you believe. And that night, that night, the jail, God came and visited the little city of Philippi. Amen. And shook that town to such an extent that the jail fell all to pieces. Yep. And it was a miraculous thing because nobody was hurt. <laughs> and yet they were all set free. Can you imagine what a strange earthquake that was? And uh, so the, the, the people were all set free. They could have run. And it was in that, those were the days when if one prisoner got away, the, the jailer was killed the next yeah. day. He was responsible for it. And those prisoners, how come not one of them ran? You know, I think there is more going on that's what's recorded in the Word of God. We'll find about, the, about when we get to heaven but uh, Paul and Silas were witnessing. They said, what makes you guys sing when you've been suffering? So I believe they witnessed. I believe they led many of those jailbirds to the Lord that night. And uh, they were listening to Paul and Silas. And when Paul said, freeze, everybody, they all stopped. And when the jailer was about to kill himself, Paul said, don't hurt yourself. We're still all here. Yeah. How could he say that? Because he told them to stay and they stayed. And so the jailer came and fell before them and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, you got to uh, apologize to us for what you did yesterday. You got to dress our wounds. You got to, you got to uh, choose a church. You got to get baptized. Yep. Listen, folks, there was none of that. That's right. It was simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Listen, believe means more than just agreeing with the fact of history. Believing means to trust when you talk about the Bible, to trust Christ as their Savior. Amen. And so that's what they did. And I'm telling you, a, a great miracle. I, I, that the, I'm saying you better decide, folks, what you believe in because what you believe in today depends. The, what you believe in, the, the, where you spend eternity depends on what you believe in. That's right. That very, very important. Are you telling others? what they need to believe in, what, need, what they need to believe. I remember some 50 years ago as a, as a lad with his dad, there was a, we had started a new settlement in southern Indiana and, and my dad was a part of that. And, and so uh, people didn't know what we were. And there's a, there, somebody came by that day. I don't know his name. I have no idea who it was, but I, I remember it. And uh, he was asking dad, he said, so what, what do you all believe in? And dad uh, went to great pains to tell him what we believe not in. He said, well, we don't believe in electricity, we don't believe in cars, we don't believe in tractors, we don't believe in having telephones, and we don't, and, you know, the list was on, and, and the guy, hmm. And so it was several, several days later, uh, this guy came back, and he said, Mr. Yoder, I've been thinking what you told me the other day. You know, I, 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 I decided I don't believe in electricity either. I don't believe in tractors. I don't believe in cars. I don't believe in modernism. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and it is shed blood to save me from my sins. I, I remember him saying that. Now, folks, it didn't click with, with us then, but years and years later, that flashed back to my mind. And I wondered when that man went away, I wonder if he prayed to God that God would shine the light, his glorious light upon us. And it didn't happen for many, many years later, but His glorious light shone upon us. Yeah. Are you telling folks about the Lord? Jesus, the Bible says in Psalms 126, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Right. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And, and so mm -hmm. take, take heart. I wonder if that fellow said, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a hopeless thing to talk to those kind of people. They're steeped in their tradition. doesn't matter. But it does make a difference. Some seed just takes a long time to germinate. But the, the, the power is in the seed. And your, your testimony is so very, very important. 
Listen, speaking of a testimony, let me divert a little bit here and say it and, and go back into the book of Daniel. There was a very wicked king that the Bible talks much, much about. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And if you want to uh, talk about a king that did so much wickedness, he's the one that made the big image in Dura 90 feet tall and commanded everybody to pray to it. And he is the one that the three Hebrew children, when they didn't do it, it brought him before him and he was so mad. He said, heat up the furnace seven times hotter than usual and throw them in. And when they did throw them in, it killed the men that threw them in. It was so hot. Yeah. But old Nebuchadnezzar shaded his eyes. He said, I thought we threw three men in there. There's a fourth one in there. And it looks as if the son of, it was the Son of God. Yep. It was the Son of God, folks. Right. And Nebuchadnezzar saw that. Now, now, skipping over some things, something happened in that old king's heart. And the next chapter, in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is given his testimony. He said, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought in me. Now notice the word wrought there. It's not used too many times. We don't use it a lot today, but it is still in our language. Now, the word wrought means more than just, oh, I heard a sermon today and God touched my heart. Yeah, he needs, that's great when God touches your heart, but sometimes he needs to take a hold of it and wring it out and just squeeze it and maybe break it. The Bible says the Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart and save it, such as be of a contrite spirit. Right. And he said that the Lord, in other, in other words, the Lord wrought something in old Nebuchadnezzar's heart. And he goes on to say, how wonderful, how wonderful are his signs, how mighty are his works, exclamation points after each one of those statements. He said, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Powerful testimony coming from a wicked, heathen king. Don't underestimate what God can do in the heart of man when Amen. God chooses to God's sovereignty. Yes is over all. One more testimony. There's a power. I'm simply saying this to emphasize to you the importance of your testimony. Use your testimony to witness the people. You say, well, I wish I'd know more scriptures. Use your testimony. Tell them what God did for you. I think of another one. If you read Mark chapter 5, you come across when Jesus was visiting communities one from another. He went to this one, communities of the Gadarenes. And when he came in there, who did he meet? He met, he met a madman, a crazy man. He lived out in the tombs and he came crying unto the Lord. And, and, and um, he was a man that, that uh, they would put chains on him and he'd break them. And he, I mean, he'd tear them. He, they'd put clothes on him. He'd rip them off and he'd be naked out there. Can you imagine the craziness of that? I can just hear the mothers as they would warn their children, Oh, children, don't you go close to the graveyard. There's a madman out there. He's crazy. He eats children for breakfast and adults for lunch and horses and cows for supper. I mean, he's, they made it sound real bad about this guy, crazy guy. And you know what? He got saved that day when Jesus came to town. And he was clothed, the Bible says, in his right mind. But the people came, and because of this lo losing the 2,000 head of hogs that you shouldn't have had at the first place, uh, they said, we want you to leave. Get, get away from this part. We can't... We can't uh, it, the economy was more important. Yeah. By the way, folks, if it takes the breaking of the American economy to get people back on their knees, then so, so be it. Amen. I'm saying simply there's things more important than the economy. And, uh, but... Uh, uh, then, Jesus, then this man was talking with Jesus. Can you imagine how happy he was to be with the Lord? And he was talking with him and, and the Lord's. And then they said, for the Lord to go. So the Lord, being a gentleman, he leaves. If you tell him to leave, he will leave. And he was fixing to leave. And the guy said, I want to go with the Lord. And the Lord said, no. You go to thy friends and show them Tell them what great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion upon thee. Amen. 
But can't you just hear the man say, Oh, no, Lord, I can't do that. I don't have any friends. Everybody that sees me is scared of me. Everybody's afraid of me. Nobody will talk to me. I don't have any friends. I just want to be with you, at least for a while. By the way, the Lord doesn't change his mind. And the Lord doesn't change his command right. for anybody. And I can just see the Lord say, Go, go to thy friends. And maybe he started going. And I can see him as he starts going. He stops and he wants to turn around. And the Lord points him on. It's because it was the Lord says, No man, having been sent to the kingdom of God, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Right. No man. Looking back, he said, don't look back, just keep going. Now, folks, the story gets more beautiful. The next verse says, and he departed. Sometimes it's a hard thing to do. Can you remember of a time? Listen, I don't know what you got you here, but I believe you're at the right place at the right time for your life. But some of you had to depart to get here. Aren't you glad you departed from wherever you were? You had to give some things up, but you departed. You had to depart someplace in order to get here. Right. Amen. And the Bible says, and he departed and uh, began to publish in Decapolis the great things Jesus had done for him. Amen. This is beautiful. Folks, there's something better yet coming up because the Bible says, and all men did marvel. Now when you Follow the word marvel there throughout the Bible. I mean, the marvelous work of the Lord. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His marvelous works to the children of men. Amen. Psalms 107. And so, folks, there's something better yet coming up. All men did marvel. You, if you follow later on, when Jesus came back to Decapolis, the Bible says many followed Him. Many got saved. Why? Because of one man's testimony. I'm telling you the power of a testimony. Don't ever underestimate. Tradition can be a blessing, but like religion, it can never, never save anybody. The power is in the blood, not in tradition. The Bible says, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's the blood, folks, unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. And hath made us kings and priests unto God. Unto him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Revelation 1, 5. I'm simply saying tradition doesn't cut it. Remember when Matthew chapter 5, the Bible says, There came the Jesus from Jerusalem, Pharisees and scribes, and, and they said unto the Lord, uh, uh, How come your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders for they wash not their hands before they eat bread? You know what? Jesus came back at them and asked them a question. He said, And how come do ye transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Yeah. Wow. You see, folks, it's the blood. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 38 years ago, I, well, my wife and I were a good Amish family, coupled with several children, and uh, we kept the rules. We, know the, we knew the rules. Most, many, many Amish people are very unfamiliar when you talk about the Bible but they know their rules down to the letter. And uh, so um, we know what we were allowed to do. The Amish, uh, it, it is a cardinal sin to drive a car. But they're allowed to drive with, ride with somebody yeah. else that drives the car. That's right, that's right. You see, it's kind of like this. One of our people drive a car, we'd send them to hell. So what we do is we hire somebody that's going to hell anyhow, pay them to do our sinning for us, get the benefit of both worlds. Hey, I just, just a thought. Now, so 
Well, I hired a driver to take me somewhere, but this driver was unique. He was different. He had a Bible on his dashboard. We'd be driving down the road, and uh, he'd say something like, Well, isn't it wonderful to have eternal life, and we know we're going to go to heaven when we die. I said, Well, you can't know that for sure. He said, would you take that Bible? Can you find 1 John 5, 13? I said, yes, sir. I prided myself. I could find that. And I, he said, when you get to it, read it to me. For these things have I written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life Amen. and believe on the name of the Son of God. I didn't know that was there. I didn't know that was there. I, maybe it was on a later time because it took me a while to digest. It took a period of months to, to, to digest these. And I said, one thing I know for sure, you have to have good works in order to go to heaven. He said, look at uh, Titus 3, 5 and Ephesians, and Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and read them to And I, I read those back to him and I didn't know those were there. And he said, take note, it says saved is in the past tense. He said, you don't wait until you get there to get saved. It's a past, a past saved has to happen now, well, it was as clear as if it was yesterday. I remember the $69 question that I asked him. I said, sir, his name was Carl Hasty. I said, Carl, are you saying that all these things that I've been doing without, no cars and driving in a zero weather in an open buggy, I remember driving and being so cold but thinking, I'm doing this for the Lord Jesus Christ. No commandment in the Bible. But then remember, the Amish don't live by the commandment of the Bible. They live by the letter of their homemade law. And so I said, all this time, I did without a telephone. We had no electricity. And we farmed with horses when it would have been so much more convenient to have a little farm all tractor. And, uh, and uh, was all of this for nothing. And he looked at me in my straight in my eyes and he said, all for nothing. What a revelation that was. He explained to me that it is finished on the cross. Oh, what a revelation that was. And it was that phrase that later, a few days later, that really struck me. It is finished. And it is a matter of me trusting the Lord. And I took him as my Savior. Sometimes I wish I could remember. Sometimes I wish he'd have set me down and said, you need to pray this prayer. Pray after me. He never did that. He just kept feeding me the Word of God. But listen, folks, I want to tell you, I trust in his Word more than in my words anyhow. The Bible says, I, Paul said, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Right. And that's talking about judgment day. Job knew about salvation. When he asked the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? And God gave him the answer that later on Job said, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, that he shall stand again in the latter day Amen. upon the earth. But folks, there's a price to pay for an Amish person to get saved. Yep. There's a thing called shunning. And, uh, oh my, uh, you can't, we, we can, we, my wife was the oldest of, four, of 14 children, and um, we could go to none of those weddings as those children would get married. And uh, we were not even, they didn't even want us to come to funerals. They said, don't come to our funerals. Now, we would go anyhow. But let me tell you a little story. How many of you remember Paul Harvey? Yes, Paul Harvey. The rest of the story. Well, one day, we was uh, in Missouri there, just ready to sit down and eat. And uh, it was 12 o'clock. I said to him, I said, oh, Paul Harvey's going to come on right now. Let me listen. Let me turn Paul Harvey on. We'll listen to him as we eat. And uh, the first thing he said as he came on, he said, an 18-wheeler run over a horse and buggy in southern Indiana, Peoria, Indiana. The husband, the farmer, of the rig was thrown clear of the rig, unhurt, but the mother of 11 children is dead. I jumped up and I said, my sister has got 11 children. My sister lives in Pe near Peoria, Indiana. I said... Oh my, I, no, I can't be her. So I sat back down and I, and I was back pacing the floor back and forth. And my wife said, well, you used to live there. You got your neighbor's number yet. Why don't you call and find out? And so we, I called and he said, you mean you haven't heard? No, we hadn't heard. But indeed it was my sister that had, was killed when an 18-wheeler 
run over her buggy. And uh, uh, while we were still in that Selma, that big fight was on because the Amish refused to, to uh, use the slow-moving vehicle sign, the emblem, mm -hmm. which could have saved her life that day. They said, well, the trucker fell asleep. Maybe he did, but there, they, he was not losing the road. And they see things like stop signs or, or, or special signs, but that would be a story of its own. I'm simply saying there's a price to pay for somebody who makes a profession of being saved. <laughs> Quick little story. First time we were in the Baptist church, um, we hired a driver to take us. And uh, back up a little further, we had, we had just been shunned, and for several weeks we were just meeting uh, together, and, and we would preach to each other, and, and not, we had no direction, no leadership. And uh, my sister said, I got a card on the mail, and there was a Baptist church having an ordination service on this certain Sunday. I said, let me see it. I said, we're going to go to that because I know how the Amish, when they are short of a preacher and uh, the whole church votes, maybe 60, 70 voters in there and every man that gets more than two votes is, is uh, in the lot. And then they draw a lot and whoever gets the song book with a piece of paper in it is the one who's going to be the preacher. And sometimes it's somebody that has no calling and no gift whatsoever. And folks, if you don't think that makes for dull preaching, but on the other hand, don't you feel sorry for a man that is saddled with something like that that has no calling? Be like telling me that I have to go out into a field and load a bale, a load of bale, bales of hay, and I don't have the wherewithal to do it. Right. But so I said, I got to see this. So we went to church. We hired these uh, a driver to take us. We we're just Amish, and the preacher that was being ordained was a young pastor from uh, Texas, and uh, had gone to school in, in Springfield and he had never seen any Amish. So we come in there, we stand there in the back, and uh, it was a couple of, uh, three of us couples, young couples. And uh, so, well, I say young because that was 35 years ago. And, uh, and one of the preachers from Michigan told the young pastor, said, hey, you got some visitors back there, you better go back, shake their hands. And he looked back and he saw it, he said, I don't think I will. They're probably hecklers. They probably came to cause trouble in the ordination service today. And uh, so anyhow, we took seats. But my, was I made. They asked that preacher 80 questions that day, and he answered everyone with the scripture. I was so impressed. Well, the song leader got up and said, everybody's invited to stay for a meal out at the fellowship hall. And Amish love to eat. How many of you know that? And so we, we stayed and we ate. And after, this, after the meal, I must have asked that that preacher, 50 questions, but, uh, but he went to that young preacher and said, you got some people that are hungry for the word of God. You've got to tend to them. Nine o'clock the next day, he was out at our house and our life was changed forever. We went to that little church, Independent Baptist Church, had been taken out of the Southern Baptist Church just several years before that, but I'm so glad. I'm so glad that we didn't get into the One World Church of uh, Armstrong or something like that. Uh, we were so vulnerable at that time, but God directed us. It was in 1952 that um, the dreaded word polio floated around in, in, in parents' houses and nobody wanted to talk about it because it was incurable. And, uh, and, and one day I was sitting on a little chair and my mama told me to raise my right hand and I, I couldn't raise it. And she said, well, raise the left hand. I couldn't raise it. And she knew she was scared to death. She went out and told my dad. And dad quickly went to the neighbor, hired a hired a driver to take to, to uh, St. Joseph Hospital in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, yes, when we got there, um, I was pretty much paralyzed, and the doctors didn't hold out much hope for me to make it. But uh, God had other plans, and, and I survived that after being there for weeks and weeks at St. Joseph Hospital. And, uh, but it changed my life forever, as you may guess. And uh, uh, I was, grew up in a one, got my education in one-room schoolhouse, and I failed the, earth, the third grade. You say, why would you fail the third grade? Because I was unbearably dumb. And my dad was a, was a teacher, and he did me the greatest favor by having to take a third grade over to school. It was more fun after that. But, but that was before it was politically correct just to push kids on through and uh, give them a diploma they can't even read themselves. Hallelujah, huh? But by nature, I was an active child, and uh, I just to be different was the most painful thing for me. When I became a teenager, I realized, I wonder if ever a girl is going to like me. Because 
an Amishman's manhood is measured by how much work he can slam away in a day's time. And I was not able to do that. And I realized I worried about it uh, because I was convinced that never would a decent, would a intelligent Amish girl um, take this cripple for a husband. Yet I just wanted to be what the other was, what the others did. I just wanted to be what others were. But in no way, let me just fast forward it. I, in no way can I describe to you the surprise of all surprises, my stunning thrill that I had when Ida said that she would be my girl and that she would, she would marry me. Oh, my goodness, besides being so beautiful, uh, besides being delightful and ever so charming, I knew that what I had a hold of was a priceless gem, a precious treasure. Oh, listen, folks, after that, I'll guarantee you, the sun shone brighter, the, the uh, grass was greener, the, the, uh, the sky was bluer, and even the birds sang more beautifully in the treetops because it was all so much better. To this day, I have not gotten over it. Folks, we've been married since June the 5th. It's 45 years that we've been married, and it's just been beautiful. And when I preach about the, out of the Proverbs 31 woman, I'm talking about my wife. Amen. Who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. That's right. The heart of her husband is safely trust in her so that he shall have no need to spoil. That's she right. will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Amen. That's right. Some years ago, I... Uh, I was preaching away, and I was going through a similar thing like this, and, and I said, folks, it was, a, it, was a, it was a big, big, pretty big church, and there's lots of people, and I said, uh, I said, honey, come on up here to the platform. I want folks to see her. I want folks to see her. Yeah, she's beautiful. I want you to see her. I want you to see her. And I said, smile real big for the people when you're up here, and she came up there, and uh, I, I noticed I had to tell her the third time before she came, but she finally came up there, and she did smile. Folks, it was not until I got back home I realized it was just a paper smile. And guess who got called to the platform when we got back home? Anyhow, I promised. She made me promise I would never do that again. So, folks, I'm not going to make her come to the platform today. But, uh, but uh, I will tell you this. For a nominal fee, I'll let you have her autograph after the service. Amen. Dealing with my handicapped in grade school was most perplexing to me. You see, they would, back in those days, we would choose a captain, two captains, the, the, the brightest, the smartest, the strongest ki boys in school would be the captains, and they would choose sides, and they would choose until the last one chosen. Would you like to guess who was the last one chosen every stinking time? And sometimes they would negotiate, if you take him, we'll let you go up to bat first. And about that time, I would say, you know, I'm not feeling so well, I think I'll just watch. And they say, that'd be a good idea. But I was bitter. I didn't know I prayed. I said, what's, wh where do I fit in? What's my part? And what do I do? I was the only one. It was not until many years later that I found or was found of another captain from another team, the captain of our soul, the Bible says. He's called the chief cornerstone also. He's the great shepherd, the good shepherd, the creator of all things. He is the bishop of our soul. His name is called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, the Bible says, He is the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon. He is the bright and morning star. And while He is called the Lamb of God, He's also called the Lion of Judah. He is the author of our salvation, the Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Savior, the Messiah, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Praise the Lord. This is my captain I'm talking about. And never again will I experience rejection again. I know how it feels to be rejected, how it feels not to be chosen. You see, one day I found a letter that was written to me from God. You say, uh-oh, where is this going now? Well, don't you think that's very special? That's very precious? And this is the letter. And it says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And he said, Ye, that is in the plural, folks. And so that's to all believers who are serious servants of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So I purpose to be content and very thankful 
with what I can do. I do not want to focus. I do want to fuss about the things I can't do. I don't want to fret and worry about it, what I can't do, because by the grace of God, there's some things that I can do. I can tell a sinner how to be saved. The Bible says but that he is not slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's right. No salvation without repentance. That's right. And so I can tell folks that. I can tell people about it. I can tell them how to be saved. John 5, 13 says, These things I have written unto you, that you might know that you have eternal life. Listen, it is my job, not my job to persuade somebody, to convince somebody, but to give them the information, the right information, the right facts, and then let God do the convincing and the persuading. Amen. Yes, who, tell them who Christ is. By the way, the Bible says, For God commanded His love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right. God didn't take you because you were such a lovely person, or because I was so lovely. No, He took us when we were... He paid for our sins when we were most unlovely. Right. And, and uh, the Bible says, He was made sin. Now, now, try to wrap your mind around this. He was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I don't understand that. But I know that God says, as many as received him, to them give he power to become the sons of God. Right. What's keeping you from receiving him? Amen. Listen, if God has paid the price, and I, you say, well, I don't know if it's the right timing. I want to tell you what God says about that. He says, behold, now is the acceptable time. Yep. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now he's not talking about tomorrow. Now he's not talking about yesterday. He's saying right now. He, if, he's, if he says that he'll accept you, why on this green earth would you not accept him? Yeah. As many as received and them gave you power because I, I just want to do whatever I can do, wherever I can, for as ever long as I can, whenever I can, as much as I can, as often as I can, God, so God help me. The Bible says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Jack Mitchell was a jeweler in Peel, Indiana. And uh, he, he was different. But one thing, I mean, he knew his watches, he knew his clocks. Everybody far and wide brought the clocks into him. Now, what was different about him? Jack Mitchell had no legs. He had a little stool he rolled upon. You say, Preacher, how did he have, where, where, how, do you, how could he have feet without legs? Hey, if you don't have legs, you don't have feet, dummy. Can you figure that out? He didn't have neither. And so one day I was with Dad and Dad was in there and Dad was feeling real sorry for, for him. And he said, Jack, I just want to sympathize with you. I realize that you're so handicapped. There's so many things you can't do. And, and talking about his handicap here. And he kept talking and Jack never stopped working what he was doing. He kind of, kind of smile played on his lips while, he was, while Dad was talking. Finally, Dad uh, kind of ran through what he was saying and Jack looked up through his spectacles. He had a bunch of magnifying glasses attached to his specs there. You remember how they did that? And he said, Mr. Yoder, let me tell you something. If I was out on your farm trying to harvest the crops and plant the crops and milk the cows and load the hay and, and haul the wood, he said, I would be severely handicapped. He said, on the other hand, if you were sitting behind this desk on my chair trying to work on this jewelry and fix these clocks, you would be severely handicapped. Handicap. And then he made this statement, a statement I would never forget. A man is only handicapped when he attempts to do something that he's not made to do. I would leave that. I know he didn't think much about it, but I would never forget that statement. It has helped me throughout life. Isn't it wonderful how God speaks to you through, through incidents like that that happen along the way? And so uh, there's, there's one thing I wish so much I could do. And I see other preachers that are up here and they make, a mo they make their motions, they raise their hands and, and, and uh, I wish I could raise my hands. I want to I wanna make some points that I could make better if I could raise my hands. And so I can't do that. But listen, I, it's okay. It's okay. I praise the Lord that I can raise my voice. Amen. The Bible says, cry aloud. Spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Amen. 
Yes, I can do that. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me. In Paul's last letter, he told Timothy, Paul was about to die. He was about to be decapitated by the Roman government. And he said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. While I purpose to be content with my lot and station in life, like Paul says, that uh, he, he has no, he, he has learned to be content in whatever state he was in. I have learned that too, to accept things that I cannot change and try to change things I can. But while I accept those things, I've got my eye on the future, folks. The Bible says, for we know when this earthly house of this body were dissolved, PJ, we have a home, a house in heaven, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And he said, he said in verse 8 of that same chapter, we are confident, yea, willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Right. I'm, so, listen, you can't scare me with death. Amen. That's why Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. Gain. I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered the heart of any man what God has prepared for them that love him. Right. God himself shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, neither, neither crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Amen. Amen. In closing, folks, I want to close with this statement and maybe a couple questions. But I just want to say this. I have absolutely no excuse not to serve God with all of my heart, with all of my soul. That's right. What excuse are you making for not going all the way? for not coming all the way with the Lord. And I want to say this. If God can use a nobody like me, I don't have not even a high school education, no college education. And sometimes preachers talk about these things and I'm, 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 I'm out on the fringes. Um, I don't... There's also... I'm very limited what I can do. But just think what God can do with somebody who's able like you, who's educated like you, and this is important though, you must be totally yielded to God. And it's amazing what God wants to do with your life. Remember those two testimonies about Nebuchadnezzar and about the, the Gadarene uh, <coughs> maniac. He was called a maniac. Oh, by the way, there's another one. Rahab the harlot. What a testimony she had. And they kept calling her even after her, even after her coming to God. They kept call, she was known by that name because yeah. that's how she was identified. Right. I want to close with this. and I'll tell you when I finally close. <laughs> Beautiful invitations in the Bible. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Amen. He didn't make a condition if you're smart enough, if you're talented enough, if you're what, this or that or the other. He said if you open the door. Now folks, it takes a real hard heart. Have you ever done this? Let me just back up. Have you ever done this? Somebody knocked on your door and you decided for one reason or another you're not going to open the door. It's hard to do. You're sitting there, and the, the door, somebody's knocking. I mean, there's an automatic urge for us to go open the door. I mean, I go open the door if, when there's total strangers there. I'll open the door. What do they want? I'm telling you, it takes a, you have to harden your heart not to open the door when somebody knocks. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's an awful thing to think that Jesus said that he stands and knocks at the door of your heart and you're not going to answer the door? That's right. Think about that. Yeah. It's one thing for your, your uncouth neighbor to knock on the door and you're not going to answer it, but you better answer the door when Jesus <coughs> knocks. Because you know what he said? My spirit will not always strive with man. Right. Again, in, in uh, Isaiah, he said... Woe unto him who striveth with his maker. Give up the fight. Amen. 
Amen. Just give it up. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. There's many heavy laden folks if they would just come, but they will not come. See, there's something about that first step. We need to take that first step. Have you ever wondered why did God say, Draw an eye to me and I will draw an eye to you? He first said, You make that step. Draw an eye to me. I will draw an eye to you. He said He will. He will come in. If you just open the door, He will come in. And you say, But preacher, you don't understand. If you know my history, if you know what all I have done, all hogwash on that. He said, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be like crimson, they shall be made white as snow. Yep. Did you catch that? He said, Come now. Right. Don't you put it off till tomorrow. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. You may not have that opportunity. You may not have that chance Amen. of tomorrow. Come today. Preacher. Sure. 